Welcome to Saving Europe. I'm the novelist and historian Henry Viner Brooks, and in this series, we're following the lives and travels of two of history's unsung heroes. The decisive leadership shown by the 6th century monk Columbanus and the 20th century statesman Robert Schumann helped rescue Western civilization in two very different dark ages. So, joined by my two sons, I'm on a 4,000 mile, 12 country, post-Brexit odyssey to find out if these men and these dark ages can teach us anything for today. In this episode, we follow Columbanus and his friends from Arbon on Lake Constance to the foot of the mighty Alps. It's a stark glimpse into the dark side of pioneer mission, with starvation, murder, systemic injustice, relational conflict, and two more sad partings. But it's not all doom and gloom. We get a chance to see how the Merovingian Franks got to pioneer what we now call the social gospel, and how one Columbanian monastery was instrumental in the formation of the Swiss nation itself. All this and more, this time on Saving Europe. If you're finding this content helpful, then please return the favour by liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and perhaps even sharing it with a friend. And also, do check out the new book which accompanies this series. Thanks for watching. I took some time that evening to visit Arbon at the other end of the lake. The little chapel looks quite a decent age. It was here that Columbanus first arrived, and it was here, on another rock, that Gaul preached to the Swabians in their own tongue. And it was also here that Columbanus would take leave of his Amanchara, his soul friend, for the very last time. At Arbonne I wanted to mull over the painful circumstances of Columbanus' departure from the area, but also highlight how even this, in the light of history, turned out for the good of his mission and legacy. Well, well, Arben. Well, this is Arben. I just want to read a little section from Saving Europe about this place. It's now quite a bustling little touristy town. It was not so in the day. The Latin name was Arbor Felix, and it first appears in the records around 280. According to the chronicles, Armanius Marcellinus, Emperor Gratian went to Arbon in 378 and he stayed there till 401. Make of that what you will. Columbana stayed only about one year and the circumstance of his leaving, the split with Gaul, are shrouded either by the mists of time or else a discretion of the sources. Jonas doesn't even mention it but rather gives us some wider geopolitical data that serves his larger narrative curve of Columban story. Once again, the Merovingian family feuds are the grist of Jonas' plot. In this instance, it is Columbanus' old adversaries, Theodoric and Brunhilde, who are at war with his patron, Theodobert II. Jonas tells us that Columbanus witnesses this fratricidal war in a vision but refuses to pray for his patron when prompted to by a presumptuous young monk. As it transpires, Theudebert is defeated twice by his brother in 612 and imprisoned in a monastery by his grandmother and later murdered along with his son. But the victory of Brunhild and Theodoric does not profit them in the long run. Within a year, they too are both dead. Theodoric dies either of dysentery in Metz, or if we take Jonas' account, by burning alive in a building there. Brunhilde has it worse. She, the arch betrayer, is finally double and treble crossed, defeated and captured by King Clotha, who, as one 8th century chronicler records, ordered that she be lifted onto a camel and led through the entire army and then tied to the feet of wild horses and torn apart, limb from limb. To his great credit and humane virtue, Columbanus later wrote to King Clotha, reprimanding him for his unnecessarily barbaric treatment of Brunhild. Thus, the prophet who had foretold her death in the end of her dynasty, by the largeness of his soul, also became the prophetic voice against her executioner's excesses. And all this he did at a time of great personal trial and grief and hardship. Around this time, Strabo in his Vita Galli tells us 
that two monks were murdered while out looking for escaped cattle. This might have been a simple retaliation over hunting rights or something more sinister. Whatever the facts of the case, they did not feel that Duke Gunzo, up at Uberlingen at the other end of the lake, they did not feel that Gunzo was in their corner. According to Jonas, Columbanus had been planning to go to make his final destination Italy. Brigentz had proved a sore trial. They had nearly starved over the winter, surviving on berries and wild apples. Columbanus had even considered a quote, going to the land of the Wends, who are also called Slavs in order to illuminate their darkened minds with the light of the gospel. As it turns out, of course, uh, his prophecies about his political enemies do come true and uh, he could have stayed, but he has made his mind up. Gaul will not go with him. Gaul says he has a stomach complaint, but surely it is more than that for Columbanus to, uh, to give him such a harsh sentence. Strabo writes that he commanded that Gaul never celebrate mass again until he gave him leave. In fact, in another manuscript, it, the word is excommunicato, which excommunication mustn't be seen like as a sort of final casting out, but it's certainly um, certainly serious. So whatever had transpired between them, it had been a very painful and momentous thing. Gaul favoured the people and the area, and he was a skilled fisherman in this lake, lapping at my feet. He spoke the language and perhaps felt that he could make a real impact where he was. It was time for Columban to do without him. This surely is nearer the truth. The cover-up is no doubt inspired at some level by reverent and loving memory, but it does show the weakness of the hagiographic genre. Before following Columban over the Alps, we had better cast our eyes about what he left in the area. The greatest thing that he left was Gaul his friend, his Anamchara. Gaul rode back across the lake with his fishing nets and was nursed by a priest called Villemar. Uh, later, Gaul set up a small hermitage at Arbon near the outflow of the river Steiner, which is that way, where he continued to attract converts from among the locals. Why here and not at Brigantium is not clear. Some take inference that Athala later abbot of Bobbio, stayed with Gaul, but it is hard to be certain. It is even possible that Columban was the only Irishman in the party that crossed the Alps. And of course the question we ask is, had there been some crisis in leadership? Had those hardy souls gone as far as they could with their beloved abbot? Gaul became a powerful preacher among the Alemanni, but he refused any honours, including the bishopric of Constance, or even to follow Eustatius, Eustace as abbot of Luxoy. At some point, it is assumed that Gaul moved his base of operations upriver to the site of the medieval city, which now bears his name. He died at a very great age in his mid to late 90s in 646. And though he trained under Comgal in Bangor, scholars have posited that he might even have been like Schumann from the Alsace region, which would account for his language skills. The monastery and the city of St. Gallen was founded after this time on the site where he had built a stone oratory. It became one of the great lights of medieval Europe and its library, its UNESCO heritage listing says that as a monastery, it is, quote, one of the most important in Europe, quote, its library is one of the richest and the oldest in the world and contains precious manuscripts such as the earliest known architectural plan on parchment. And what's rather moving is toward the end of Columban's life, one of his last acts as he is dying up in that cave in the mountains uh, above Bobbio, is to send his kombucha, his stick, back to Gaul. Um, I think he realizes toward the end that of course great love is the key, not so much all the other great things. It is grace and truth and uh, I think it must have grieved him those last few years in Lombardy that he had fallen out with Gaul, who'd supported him so much. So his staff is sent back to this area. And strange to say, it is here at St. Gallen that Columbanus's legacy is most richly preserved.
But before we take leave of these Frankish rulers, who after all represent the foundation stones of northern European governance, let me do what Jonas is unwilling to, and that is to give credit where credit is due. When we say that Europeans are an uneasy mix of the Roman patrician, the marauding barbarian and the Christian saint, we are often disdainful of that Teutonic barbarian element. And yet even taking a casual glance through 6th century Frankish history shows how quickly the gospel seed sown by men like Hilary and Martin became the tentative shoot of economic and social equality in subsequent centuries, as the patricians and the barbarians aimed their sights at becoming saints. For example, who knew that it was the Merovingians who laid the foundations of the medieval system for dealing with pauperism and beggary? The Gallic Church kept lists of matriculariae, those entitled to receive charity. And the first Council of Orléans in 511 reads like any modern set of guidelines from the Department of Social Security. Those unable to work should receive food and clothing, etc. The second Council of Tours in 567 designated that every community must take care of its own poor and see to it that the poor not wander about from place to place. There is evidence that this active charity had measurable successes in limiting pauperism. Special public buildings were raised for the relief of the poor and infirm. It was all highly organized. Gregory of Tours writes of a leper asylum in Chalon, and we know that there are others in Verdun, Metz, and Paris. We read of a 20-bed hospital in Colombier, which had a staff of physicians. And entrepreneurial bishops like the Sideratus of Verdun and Nicetius of Treves were the Richard Bransons of their days, raising whole areas out of poverty. Of course, it was no picnic and certainly no utopia, which age is, apart from perhaps our own. But under the Franks, even the lot of the serfs was made bearable. And, what is more, the position of the slaveholders almost untenable. For example, Clovis Catholic Queen Clotilda was a keen abolitionist and her influence spread. As one German historian put it, the clergy preached, the bishops remonstrated and insisted, the annual councils formulated their demands, which, appealing to divine authority, were virtually decrees in the interest of humanity. Churches, abbeys, monasteries stood ever open as asylums for the oppressed and at one of the councils held at Lyon, Early in the 6th century, the bishops were enjoined to excommunicate any master who killed a slave without giving him the opportunity of defence. Furthermore, if a dying slave owner loved his own soul, he was encouraged to release his slaves as a final act of penitence. The 5th Council of Orléans was unstinting. A slave could be ordained as a priest even without the permission of his master. And there's one last place associated with Columbanus in Switzerland. It is another place of bittersweet farewell. But if we ever wanted to see how these monastic cultural kernels might blossom into democratic civilizational units, then Dissentis Abbey certainly proves the point. So uh, Columbanus left the broad valley of the Rhine, leaving Gaul behind him, the terrible burden that must have been. The word used, as we know, is excommunication. So um, a real falling out with his soul friends. And not only that, possibly a Tala stayed behind as Columbanus moves south. And then here at this place, underneath Mount Gotthard, Sigisbert, who'd been with him so long, also stopped. Uh, here, he had a hermitage here under Mount Gotthard and uh, that later became this famous abbey of Dissentis at the foot of the Alps. Indeed, Dissentis became a very great monastery during the Middle Ages. The name derives from Desertina, or a deserted wilderness. The first archaeologically discernible abbey dates to around 700, well after Sigisbert's death, and almost straight away became a cultural and political centre during the Carolingian Renaissance. Its position at the foot of the pass to Italy meant that kings and emperors like Charles Martel, Pepin, Charlemagne were visitors and patrons. 
During the Middle Ages, it became a place of international importance. The Prince Abbots of Decentis were the Lords of the Rhine Valley and they played an important role in the founding of the Grey League in 1395, which, when allied with the Swiss Confederation, became the political nucleus of modern Switzerland as we know it today. The Abbey is now a school and a worthy legacy. It's not bad from a cell, a hermitage. This is an enormous complex. This looks like the foundation of an earlier church. Here's the apse with two side um, apses. It's extraordinary what'll happen if you had a bit of vision. These guys, you know, it's, it's the story world over for the Irish, like at Glendalough, like Columbanus, wherever they set up their hermitage. People joined them. They knew that they had something and they wanted a bit of it. People flocked to this remote place and built this enormous complex over the centuries. Sigisbert, extraordinary influence. Well, it's all very well done up. They're just in the middle of a 15 million pound convert, uh, renovation of the main church. This is just a small one out the side. Um, as you can see, it's quite, uh, quite lush, the Baroque Abbey, now Benedictine. I just checked with one of the monks and it does sound right, Sigisbert was from Luxoy, uh, hence the slightly Frankish sounding name. He established his hermitage here this is the resulting abbey that grew from his work. So hats off, Sigisbert. We can actually see the um, part of the old medieval church. Also, we can see just a little bit of the um, artwork from the later medieval period. Uh, the devil and the uh, deadly sins graphically depicted in fresco and, uh, and here's Christ in a panto creata this, um, this symbol of blessing inside this um, ellipse and uh, yeah very good anyway. in 1799 the abbey was burned and plundered by Napoleon's army the books and the archives were destroyed, including an irreplaceable 7th century chronicle. Anything of material value was sold to fund the French campaign of conquest. Decentis had survived a similar sacking by Muslims in 940, but it took nearly 200 years to recuperate from the barbarity of the French. Shriven of its former worldly prestige, Decentis sought a very different settlement in the post-Enlightenment West. Indeed, the conflagration that destroyed its printing shop had left half-melted type that was later used for the pipes of the current organ. Thus, in an act of metaphor come poetry, it was almost as if the purifying fire had turned their knowledge to wisdom and their prestige to praise. But Columbanus was not stopping. He was not a man to stay in one place. He'd made up his mind he was going to go to Italy. To go to Italy, he must go up the Via Luc Magna, up here. Or what we call the, the Luc Magna Pass now. 6,000 feet. It's a long route into Lombardy, uncertain of what reception he'd get there. Lombardy was a a new kingdom. The Ostrogoths had been kicked out, who had kicked out Roman rule. And then 25 years previous, these Lombards had turned up. They were ex-mercenaries from the pay of Justinian. Would they give Columbanus the reception that he hoped for? Or would it be more of the same like under Brunhilde and Theodoric? We're gonna follow him over the pass and we're gonna find out.
But before we go, we have one more colossal treat in store this side of the Alps, and that is an exclusive tour with Dr. Philip Lenz of the Irish Manuscript Collection at the San Gallen Library, which houses one of Europe's finest collections of medieval documents. And after that, in episode 13, we'll cross the Alps into Italy. Yeah, the way that Columbanus came. It's a beautiful plateau. We will sniff out almost forgotten locations associated with Columbanus and finally arrive in Lombardy to meet another remarkable Dark Age queen. A very extraordinary woman called Theodolinda. Where it turns out that Columbanus has something she needs. So, at the cathedral she built, we'll also sample Columbanus' literary legacy before heading further south. All this and more next time on Saving Europe. Remember also that this journey was part of the research for a book which uses the lives of Columbanus and Schumann to explore the unlikely arrival, survival, victory and atrophy of European civilization. Do follow the links below to find out more. Please let us know what you thought of this episode, what you liked, what you didn't, what was new to you. Just start a conversation below in the comments section. And of course, if you found the content helpful, then we're pretty sure you're going to like this next one suggested here. But also while you're there, don't forget to help us by subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching.